webinar wholeheartedly welcome you all to a session on advanced future applications of nuclear energy space and defense by dr rakhi mehta madam today we have amongst us dr rakhi mehta co instructor nuclear engineering at department of chemical and applied science university of toronto and research assistant at york university dr s r joshi sir principal government engineering college bharuj professor n r vaghela sir head of chemical engineering department government engineering college bharuj professor arun patel sir coordinator of today's event and all invited guests we warmly welcome you all may i now request professor n r vaghela sir head of chemical engineering department to address the gathering please sir okay thank you ma'am uh, respected uh, dr rakhi mehta ma'am uh, respected principal sir dr s r joshi sir all the faculty members and dear participants uh, very good afternoon to all of you on behalf of the government engineering college bharuj i warmly welcome our today's webinar speaker dr rakhi mehta ma'am co instructor at uh, nuclear energy at uh, university of toronto i i, I express uh, my deepest gratitude for expect, uh, accepting our uh, invitation uh, thank you ma'am and my pleasure. welcome you okay thank you uh, today's topic for webinar is advanced future application of nuclear energy space and defense uh the idea behind the uh, arranging this webinar is to explore the uh, the nuclear energy and its application in the defense and space so it's considered under the uh, 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 content beyond the syllabus of energy technology subjects in today's webinar we have a, a, a around uh, 550 participants and uh, a few of them are uh, from outside gujarat as well as from uh few are from outside india also so i uh, warmly welcome to all uh, across the gujarat and uh, outside gujarat also so once again i welcome to all of you uh, thank you uh, thank you very much thank you thank you sir it's my pleasure and privilege to call upon dr s r joshi sir principal government engineering college bharuj to bless the session with his kind words sir please thanks madam for inviting me to speak something on this kind of webinar of chemical engineering department i warmly welcome dr rakhi mehta thank you on this very special webinar organized by the faculty of chemical Engin engineering department especially professor arun patel and professor n r vaghela it's a great privilege to see as a principal that the departments are growing and they are involving in such kind of activity day by day and they are actively participating in the overall development of the students it has been a nice experience to see that faculty members are growing themselves they are exercising their role as a leader in the development of students so i am very happy that chemical engineering department is taking this kind of extraordinary initiatives the topic itself suggests is real very high as far as students are concerned i can see around 80 participants are there i am sure out of this 80 around 25 to 30 are faculty so i see that it is not a good situation i appeal to faculty members as well as student to consider my comment as a positive comment and see that the 
presence of students is more in this kind of webinars dear students please try to understand that to organize such kind of webinars is really very difficult first of all to identify the topic and then to identify the experts you just try to understand that today's expert is from canada she is sitting for your benefit at very early morning at canada right so if faculty members of your department and external experts are putting this much efforts it is your turn to reciprocate so i appeal to faculty uh, students that you take as much benefit as much you you can take from this kind of webinars honestly speaking i am not satisfied with the response of the students uh, arun sir this seminar is for only final year or for all three years all three years sir hello ha hello yes sir for all years we have arranged so can we do that the students of gc baruj who have registered yes sir and not participated now can we inform to their parents definitely sir we have uh, make such kind of provision also and we have intimated regarding this also we will uh, track them from the enrollment number wise also and that kind of information already circulated to all the students thank you thank you very much i welcome uh, dr rakhi mehta ma'am i am also from surat and i have come to know that uh, you are you were working at scat so i am happy to know that and, thank you sir moreover uh, i am closely associated associated with the faculty members of scat as well as principals of scat uh, yes. present uh, principal hiren patel is my very close friend nitin patel is my batchmate so mm -hmm. i have been associated with scat since long yeah. i don't know whether we have met or not i don't know we we but, might have if i see your face i can recognize but i cannot okay, see your sorry. face right now <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, hello know. sir <laughs> yeah fine so ma'am uh, i really welcome you from bottom of my heart and thanks 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 a lot that you have taken really pain to wake up early in the morning and sit for the delivering this kind of experts ma'am thank you very much please carry on please thank you thank you very much sir uh, thank you uh, it's my It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rakhi Mehta, Madam, co-instructor, Nuclear Engineering, Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Science, University of Toronto, research and research assistant at York University. Madam did her postdoc in 2016 on investigating efficient removal of heavy metals from oil fields. produced water from oil fields of backers field from california state university of california usa she did her phd in year 2014 on nanofuels and biofuels from svnit surat dr mehta has played various responsible roles she has academic teaching experience of 15 years and 5 years of active research in industrial projects madam served as assistant professor for 11 years at department of chemical engineering sarvajanik college of engineering and technology surat from 2005 to 2016 after that she was associate professor and head of chemical engineering department at scat surat till june 2017 dr mehta has 15 international publications five national publications and active participation in 40 international and national conferences to her credit dr mehta has also co-chaired a research session on process chemistry and technology and presented a research paper entitled nanofuels 
preparation, stabilization, and conversion at third third World Congress on Petrochemistry and Chemical Engineering at Atlanta. Madam has also received award of outstanding performer, award of professional contribution on global platform, and also received international travel grant. Her area of interest are nanofuels, biofuels, nuclear engineering, and sustainable energy. I request Madam to please take charge of session. Madam, please. Thank you, Ms. Ramani. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so before we start, I would like to thank uh, Joshi sir, uh, Vagila sir, as well as Arun sir, Mangesh for uh, organizing this uh, particular webinar and for, in, uh, for inviting me for this particular session. Yes, it's 7 uh, here in Toronto and hopefully it's 4.30, more than that, uh, in, in India. Uh, as uh, prof uh, Professor uh, Joshi said, uh, very it was really correct that the students' participation should be there, but I'm happy that the faculties are, are also taking that much of interest. So we should take it in a positive way, sir. They're also in... Uh, sessions. So uh, I would like to start my webinar session and uh, if you have any doubts students uh, please keep it keep a note of it and uh, maybe I'll be taking the question at the end of the session. Uh, so good morning everyone in Toronto and uh, good evening everyone in India. I will start my session now. I'll share my screen. So uh, today's session is on advanced future applications of nuclear energy, uh, space and defense. Now this specific topic we have decided because I was uh, approached with the, with the concept of uh, providing something innovative, something which is going to be the future of uh, energy. And what can be the best to discuss the nuclear energy? Nuclear energy to uh, just take a wrap up the session or maybe to start the session. So this is my intro as uh, uh, Mr. Ramani gave very well. Uh, only one small thing. I am also I was also session lecturer. So I've taught in third year chemical engineering a couple of uh, core subjects. And along with that, as ma'am said, uh, truly that I basically am I'm an Indian and uh, a pure Surti from Surat and I have served uh, at SCED, Sarvajani College, uh, as a head of the department, as a SOSI professor, as assistant, assistant professor for more than 12 years. So it has been a pleasure working there and it's a pleasure working here too. This will be the contents of my session uh, throughout the session, whatever we are going to take. I will be starting with the statistics of the world for the energy uh, we will be touching upon the renewable sources of energy. What are the different sources? I'll be touching upon that. Why are we focusing on nuclear? A little bit, uh, you can say, enlighten you on, on that thing. Uh, we will be your energy. This is important. Uh, very quickly, I'll take the non-power applications uh, because power applications, you already know, it's electricity. So I'm, I'm going to just focus on non-power applications. And its focus will be on two major applications. One is in space. So the space uh, uh, travel, where how isotopes are uh, uh, used into that. So I will be focusing on that. We will be I'll be focusing on uh, working of radioisotope thermoelectric generators, which are called RTGs, right? The complete, the, how does it work? Where, which are the missions that has already been commenced on the basis of that, that we will be taking a little bit in detail. What are the current advancements of um, RTG, which is MMRTG? and which is the recent source of, uh, you can say, trouble that I'll, uh, I will be taking up. And uh, then at the end, I'll be taking a couple of, uh, you can say, interesting facts from future of modular reactors, which we call micro reactors or small modular reactors, which are now going to be, uh, you can say, uh, handmen for the defense, right? So even US has already started, I was just reading a news today in of global, 
uh, where they say that even uh, Ottawa, that means Canada, is also investing into the small modular reactors for, for defense. So definitely we will be taking a little bit on that. Going further, uh, you have been knowing that the energy scenario, okay? So up till now, we have been thinking that, that the uh, energy has been divided into two, renewable, non-renewable sources. Renewable sources are the ones which can be replenished uh, on the regular basis, which we have abundance in nature. And non-renewable are the coal, petroleum, which is having, we have been hearing this since years that it is on the verge of extinction. Uh, so this is just a basic scenario. If you see, if we come down to the current energy scenario, this is the global primary energy consumption. And the, as the consumption says, this is, uh, you can say, uh, uh, it has been pre-calculated or you can say ex extrapolated uh, graph, which shows you that by 2050, how much amount of energy is going to be utilized. Definitely our needs are not decreasing. So definitely the use of energy is going to be in leaps and bounds increase. So we have different uh, areas or you can say different countries, uh, uh, which has been continents, which has been using these forms of energy and specifically how it has been increased in past years in the history as well. as These are the projections maybe for the future one. Right. So this was this is given by uh, Energy uh, Information Administration, which we call EIA. And uh, according to this, the energy consumption is going to increase. That is the bottom line. Now, what are the different forms of energy that we have been using since years? So we have coal, we have gas, we have petroleum, right? Along with that, a major section is of that of the renewable sources, right? So if you see the small, small bands over here, right? It has small fractions of renewable sources. And the smallest one is 10.2 we have, which is uh, nuclear, but solar, wind, geothermal, and tidal. All these different forms of energy are counted under renewable sources of energy. However, it has not been exposed that much to the maximum extent, right? However, now the windmills, uh, huge windmills are being uh, erected uh, just in, the, in, the, in, the, in order to get the better output of the energy. But still, if you see that percentage is not that high, right? So definitely the different forms of energy are going to be utilized. Now this uh, section, if you see, this gives you how different forms of energy are being used. What are the different, you can say, categories of, uh, uh, of uh, fuel that has been used? Oil, coal, if you see over here, uh, this is your natural gas. Then to come all thin layers, includes uh, uh, solar, wind energy, tidal energy, and so forth. Primary consumption by, by by source in the world, definitely it has increased. So this is what you have seen. And you also have to think about its cost effectivity. So if you see the costing of it, so maximum costing is solar. Obviously, due to photovoltaic cells, they are very difficult. I mean, very, uh, you can say, cost consuming. Definitely, I can say that photovoltaics are in, but definitely the actual amount of solar energy that has been harnessed is very less. It is less than 14% of the sun, which is coming on the surface of Earth. Then we have natural gas, uh, which I'm not going to take. That's your, again, the renew non-renewable source. Wind energy, right? Nuclear energy and hydro. Definitely hydro has been the cheapest and it has been used since years. But our focus will be on nuclear. So nuclear energy is also 7.7 .7 cent per kilowatt hour. Now, how does this effectivity come? I can just give you a very small example. We are having, a, you can say, a fuel uh, comparison, if I give you, then 20 grams of uranium, which is a, a nuclear fuel, uh, is equivalent to 400 kg of coal, 410 liters of oil, and 350 meter cubes of natural gas. So you can see the comparison that in how much amount of fuel, what energy you're getting. And obviously this brings down the rate also. Going further with the comparison of the renewable energy sources. So if you see that the major sources of the renewable we have been focusing on, right, has been solar, wind, wave, you have tidal energy, biomass, hydro, right? You have geothermal. Now, all these different forms of energy have its own pros and cons, right? They have been used, uh, they have been constructed, they have their initial cost of installation, right? But everything, uh, if, you, if you look into 
what I, we have to think is the effective energy output, right? So all these forms of energy has been used, but yes, they have not been explored that much. Okay, so if I go into each and every uh, renewable sources of energy, uh, I can just give you a, you can say a, pro, a pros and cons. Definitely solar is immense, but as I said, the hardnessing of solar energy, which is falling, which is coming to the surface of earth uh, is very less. So because of that reason, you are not getting that much effective output, which you should actually get. Right, wind energy, again, it depends upon which area it has been erected into. Not all have the, you can say, that full wind uh, probability. Obviously, if you take it in India or uh, some around where in Asia, we, we won't be having that much effect effectiveness, right? So again, uh, your windmills have some restrictions. Uh, coming to the wave and tidal, again, the position, it is uh, very much specific on the position and uh, the area of, uh, you can say, energy from where you are getting. So all these forms, geothermal you take, right? Again, you have huge amount of source within the surface of Earth, but effective way to recover it is very less. Still, geothermal form of energy is used for space heating. We are not that much effective in generating electricity. So all these things then focuses, or you can say, turns us towards nuclear. Now, nuclear form of energy, if you see over here, so this is a forecast, again, of the electricity produ production. So nuclear's main application is obviously electric electricity production because you are continuing a uh, chain reaction, and at the end of the reaction, you are getting an immense amount of energy, okay, the fission energy. So basically, if you see the U.S. electrical generation, so this is for 2020. I've taken the recent ones. So if you see the range of it and how the various, you can say, forms are changing, the coal is decreasing now. We are not using it much. I will also show you from the point of view of safety, right? So this is just on the basis of how they have been, or it is being used in the percentage-wise uh, proportion. So you have coal. If you see the nuclear one, it has been, you can say, having uh, not much ups and downs. It has been constant. Uh, however, it's, uh, if you can say, the speculation goes that nuclear is definitely going to be used. Only two factors, which is dragging it back. One is the safety. Second one is the Non-Proliferation Act, right? So I'll discuss a little bit more about it when, um, as and when it comes. So these are the different forms of energy that has been used. Here it is showing you that how renewable energy has been, you can say, distributed on the according to the source. So 45%, if you see, is wind. Obviously, wind energy, now they, uh, there are big, uh, you can say, initially, uh, so there are big, uh, you can say, hedge which are coming into this uh, uh, form of energy and uh, using it for production of the huge uh, wind farms. Right. So other than that, you have coal, you have your natural gas. Nuclear is almost 23 percent, if you can see over here. Right. This is a comparison of uh, U.S. electrical generation with the emitting and non-emitting. Obviously, we have uh, from the. Uh, If you see, this is the safety chart which I've taken from an international journal, which states that uh, there is a comparative study among, amongst that number of deaths that are taking place due to different forms of energy working into that. So this, this is uh, nuclear is around 10. OK, so if you see overall, the maximum is for the coal. We have the maximum coal based power plants today. Right. So basically, this is you can say instructing us, or maybe they are they are pointing towards using more of nuclear. Again, this is the uh, same uh, chart that I showed you initially. This is the investment in the, uh, you can say, nuclear generation so far. So if you see over here, these are uh, this small, very thin line of brown color shows you the investment in nuclear. Initial investment of nuclear is definitely going to be high. Uh, initial installation cost is high. Its safety is a little bit, you can say, tedious. There is a huge range of safety measures and the defense, which we call uh, of uh, the safety pro 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 protocol that has to be maintained. So, so basically, if you see the initial installation up till 2018 has not been that significant. 
majority of that has been the electrical networks that you have been using, right? If, with respect to the, you can say coal or natural gas based power plants. Now this gives you an idea about uh, the comparison of energy. This is of 2019 data. This uh, which showed that second largest source of global low carbon energy electricity. Now why we call it low carbon? Because uh, obviously it is eco-friendly. The amount of emissions is almost zero in the case of nuclear energy as compared to the others, right? And uh, we have already, this is just a small statistics. We have 450 nuclear power plants. Um, I had a slide for India also, but I don't want to go into that detail about it. So we have many of this and uh, our, our gigawatt electrical 54.7 is being generated. So this is basically installed and these are the future projections. So these are taken from EIA. So this is just a kind of a scenario which gives you that how nuclear power has, uh, has been improving, increasing, and definitely going to be expanded in future. Going further. So uh, going further, obviously, as I kept you uh, on a side that we I'm going to give you just a glimpse of nuclear energy. And as I said, definitely nuclear energy is going to be the future. Uh, a small a glimpse of nuclear fission. So basically, I'll start from there that our uh, nuclear energy is being used in two major sections. One is a power plants that is called uh, electricity generation. And the second one is where we are using the other applications, which we call non-power applications. In the power applications, generally, majority of the nuclear power plants are working on nuclear fission, uh, which is a bombardment of a neutron on a huge or a large uh, atom, atomic radii, for example, uranium. And it is broken down into smaller components with releasing of the neutrons. During this release, during this fission, huge amount of fission energy is being produced. Now, this fission energy is being used to convert water into steam, and that dead steam is used for generating the electricity. So this is the connection between how a nuclear fission reaction is basically used in the, in the form of a, you can say, controlled chain reaction in the nuclear power plants. Nuclear chain reaction has to be, uh, you can say, controlled. If it is not controlled, it will be obviously it is going to generate some kind of, uh, you can say, uh, disasters like Chernobyl, Fukushima, three islands, right? So definitely it has to be controlled and we have components in nuclear reactors which control it. So definitely that this is just, I've given you a glimpse of it. This is nuclear fission. We don't have any of the reactors working as of a nuclear fusion. Now, nuclear fusion is, again, an extremely energy requiring process uh, because you have to bring two uh, atoms together, combine it to form a larger molecule, right? And during this process, uh, though the uh, fusion energy is produced later on, but initially you require huge amount of energy to com compress it and make it as a, com a single component, right? So basically fusion reactions are, are, are being, uh, you can say, tested on the laboratory scales. Fusion reactors are working into the, you can say, lab uh, uh, atmosphere, but definitely you don't have any reactors or power plants working as of on fusion reaction. So we will not be focusing much on that because um, we are not taking the power applications today. Going further, uh, these are the non-power applications. So non-power applications, as I very quickly, uh, if, you, if I give you a glimpse of this, is where you are not using chain reaction to generate any electricity, right? You have all the rest of the applications of the nuclear, uh, which we call as uh, isotopes, radioisotopes. So radioisotopes play a very important role in different applications. You have in nuclear medicine, you have been knowing the CT scan, which is combined with PET now, which is called positron emission tomography, which is used for detecting cancers. Okay, it will be focusing and targeting on the cancerous cells and then helping the doctors to identify the exact region where the cancerous cells have started uh, developing the cyst, right? So that is basic one thing. It is used in sterilization. Food irradiation, which is one of the 
new field where it has been used obviously the food is not treated but the packets of the food are treated with the irradiation a very low uh, you can say uh, density of uh, radiation is provided which will uh, make it long lasting and reduce the staling all agriculture applications you are using it for uh, you can say mutation and breeding definitely different crop varieties are being produced by nuclear radiation okay it undergoes some kind of uh, you, uh, modification in its bead okay due to the mu uh, mu mutation and due to the presence of the gamma gamma radiation what you are pro providing to it and then why are that you are providing a specific new bead which is of more uh, better applications you have industrial inspections right uh, in the industries we know that during a production of any kind of reactors power pressure vessels we need to have destructive uh, you can say that is a method which helps in which is called non destructive test it is not going to affect the uh, product at uh, on whole but it is going to identify if there are cracks crevices uh, any kind of oil pipe breakage right so all these things comes into industrial applications there are many industrial applications i've just given you couple of them you have industrial gauges and tra tracers now tracers are specifically used underground this is used for you can say the oil oil uh, pipelines right in order to identify where exactly the crack is there okay so this is specifically going to be used into that right these radio tracers characterize uh, it is also used for finding out ground and surface water what is the level of it inside the ground this is specifically when you have the storage of water underground you have nuclear desalination obviously desalination is required because we have amount of water which is saline and uh, in in the you can say rural areas much of the water is to be required so generally what happens is a uh, nuclear desalination plant uh, is uh, constructed or you can say water treatment plant is constructed near the nuclear power plant so what happens the energy uh, which is being you can say produced Uh, is being utilized in desalining the water uh, simultaneously so it is giving you win win situation there is electricity generation along with that on one side you are also desalining the water and then we come to our today's application is nuclear powered space or uh, nuclear power uh, power travel so space travel so whenever you think about space travel what things come to your mind one thing is the uh, spacecraft right which has been moving around different planets taking up the pictures noting the geothermal conditions and all now how do, do do they get their power how do they get their energy so the biggest source of energy for spacecraft is actually solar energy but as you go away from the uh, sun maybe you go away from the sun you go to uranus you go to saturn you go to Uh, Neptune and Pluto. So as you go away and away from the sun, the solar energy goes on decreasing. So in those colder regions where you are not getting solar energy, you need some backup system, right? So basically, uh, you are you, you have, this particular form of energy is being utilized in in giving you and you can say the giving aircraft the more energy in order to keep the uh, components warm. which will be seeing later and also which is providing you the power to power the entire spacecraft other different activities so definitely space travel is not new it has been since 1961 and uh, the the most you can say favorite of it is rtgs which we are going to discuss today which is called radio isotope thermoelectric generators okay it is thermoelectric generators so these has been used in major uh, you can say operations and uh, heat which is generated by the decay of radioactive uh, source okay like let's take plutonium or americium or you take strontium it is being used for converting that heat to electricity so basically radioactive heat is converted to electricity in this particular form of uh, radio uh, rtgs Uh, so before we go ahead like there are a couple of things which which has to be taken care of is how did it come into existence who were the two uh, you can say major bodies they are in, in you can say involved in uh, uh, you, pro, pro, uh, you can say promoting rps systems and rtgs right so if we start with that so as i said you read new isotope power systems which we club into as general right it converts the radioactive heat of a nuclear fuel into electrical energy and that electrical energy that is which is power which is used for different applications right 
Now, these are specifically uh, why it is more useful because they can generate heat and give you electricity in the areas where it is not possible with the solar energy. And it can withstand very harsh conditions, right? So definitely RP, uh, uh, RPS are definitely going to be the future. They are the, in the current, they are being used. Now, two bodies which are very much involved into this is uh, DOE, that is Department of Energy. And second one is NASA, right? So DOE and NASA goes hands in hand in order to, uh, you can say, plan and uh, uh, bring out and work out these projects of space. So DOE, you know, MOU signed, uh, you can say an understanding was signed between DOE, DOE and NASA. And uh, they worked on to using the radio isotope power systems okay and uh, they, they found out they, they discussed that how it is providing the advantage for over the other space power concepts which has been used right so if you if i if you if you say that this particular memorandum was signed around 2015 and uh, basically your rpg rps systems which you are focusing into this has two types one are rtgs which is radio isotope thermoelectric generators and another one is um, RHUs which are radioisotope uh, heating systems which is used for the just heating the components right so basically NASA uh, what is the role of NASA it furnishes all the requirements related to the specification of the project how they are going to schedule the entire project interface between the nuclear fuel and thermo thermoelectrical power system management and control of you basically execution Right. Whereas DOE, its role is to explore the different possibilities, use the different fuels, try the different fuel probabilities with their national labs. OK, and come down with a particular fuel source that this is the one which is going to be used into the system. Right. So this is how DOE and NASA goes hands in hand and gives you the final product, which is out. So RPS offers obviously advantages, as I said, it is continuously running in the missions and you didn't do not, it is, you can say you're, you're working for years. I will show you the examples that it has been worked for 40 years at a stretch and without any kind of replacement. So largely independent of the changes. Now, this particular uh, applications does not, uh, you can say they are not affected by the heat storms, storm, or you can say cloud dust, any kind of access of radiation. Right, so that because of this reason, RPS plays a very important role in any kind of space troubles. Coming down to what is an RTG, okay, I have been talking a lot about RTG, but what exactly it is? So RTG is uh, basically, uh, you can say, an equipment, a combined consolidated form where there is a fuel source which generates heat. That heat is converted to electricity using the thermocouples. So this is chemical engineers come to know this very quickly because we know about RTG, we, we know about the thermocouples and uh, uh, how they convert the heat into electricity. So, so basically the radioisotopes, as you see, it is a source of energy. The power depends on initial amount of how much amount of radioisotope you are feeding into the system. Uh, which is used as a fuel because obviously you are not undergoing any chain reaction into this. Okay, there is no chain reaction taking place in this system. It is solely the decay heat of the radioactive material which is converted into electricity. Right, there is no chain reaction taking place into the system. So basically, whatever amount of fuel you are feeding into it, whatever decay heat is generated that is responsible for how much long it is going to work into the space or spacecraft, right? So basically RTGs has been powered, uh, but only you can say restriction of using RTGs or this kind of fuel is that it cannot be varied or shut down at regular intervals. It is constant outflow, right? So you cannot modify anything. It's, it's you can say you have to go, uh, it has to work. And as soon as the amount of radioactivity decreases, it stops. So that is the reason the you can say spacecrafts carry the spare batteries along with them uh, in case if they are if they want more than 100 kilowatts of power and so forth. Right. So basically heat of oxide fuel is converted into electricity using solid state thermocouples. Right. And it does not have any moving parts. So obviously you don't have any issues of friction, lubrication and stuff. 
they are safe reliable maintenance free once installed it it is you can say you have to replace it after a longer period of time because for decades it will be pro producing the dk heat you know what is dk heat right so uh, just for the students i'm just giving uh, uh, you can say brief what is a dk heat all the radioactive material you say uranium plutonium right they have their own isotopes and these isotopes are you can say unstable unstable in order to gain that stability they give out the radiation alpha beta and gamma which is called the uh, radioactive decay right out of these alpha and beta are not that harmful but gamma radiations are right so obviously uh, the chain reaction produces gamma radiation that is a reason chernobyl has been such a big uh, you can say disaster right so coming to what are radioisotopes as i gave you an example radioisotopes are you can say um, uh, radioactive material fuel which we call okay which is going to decay over the period of time and provide heat so generally in specific you are going to use uh, in uh, rtgs is plutonium 238 has been used now the uh, one thing which will strike to you is why only plutonium because plutonium has a very high decay heat we need to figure out which is giving you the maximum decay heat so that over the period of time you are getting constant source of energy right so plutonium 238 is having 0.56 watt per gram of in you can say uh, decay heat it has intense alpha emissions but it does not have any specific gamma radiation so because of this reason the shielding which is required i will explain you what is shielding and why it is so important the shielding which is required is minimum right so basically it has been used in rtg spacecrafts rovers navigation backends right other than the uh, plutonium 238 you have americium americium 241 is also used but uh, it is having low density of heat that means decay heat 0.15 watt per gram and another you can say drawback of that is that it has little bit uh, you can say emission of gamma radiation low energy gamma radiation are released so you need more shielding and strontium 19 has also been used but strontium 90 is more favorable in medical applications as compared to that in space so if i bring down the uh, properties of a radio isotope it will give me long uh half life definitely it has to have long half life so that it slowly decays and provides heat low gamma radiation in order to reduce the shielding effect or you can say shielding of uh, the fuel right high power and energy density large heat power to mass that means the density ratio and above all stability and high melting point now why it is requiring high melting point because if it is having low melting point there is a possibility of meltdown Now, if it is a meltdown, definitely it is going to affect the entire system, right? So all these properties are seen, worked out, and then they are given in. You can say uh, decided that which specific fuel fuel is to be used, right? So there are two uh, national uh, laboratories that has been working immensely in this. So one is Los Alamos National uh, Laboratory, and another one is Idaho National. Yeah. Uh, laboratory so these two laboratories have been working uh, specifically on giving and encapsulating identifying first the fuel encapsulating it then integrating it with the power system and so forth right so how does an rtg work why i'm focusing on this because this is you can say the core the heart of any of the spacecraft uh, energy which you are providing through nuclear space so i have taken very simple uh, uh, you can say uh, figure so that you can very easily understand that your entire rtg so this is my rtg let me explain you that how does an rtg work this is my rtg this are called fins the fins are on the outer side of it right and this particular section has been divided into two one is the thermoelectric cavity this one and in the center you have the heat source so basically here you can see this this blocks these are your heat sources okay and on the sides you have your thermocouples mounted right so basically your radioactivity you are getting fuel radioactivity is in the center whereas the thermocouples are assigned on the side so this is you can say an inverted version of uh, this one right 
So basically, the fuel, which is our plutonium-238, is mounted into these GPHS system. GPHS means it is called general purpose heat source, right? General purpose heat source, I will show you that what exactly it is, but you can just assume that these blocks are GPHS. And into this, you have your fuel, which is plutonium-238, okay, giving away its DK heat. Now, as soon as this DK heat is given out, there are thermal insulation. So there is a there is a complete block over here, which we call as a heat distribution block. OK, it is made up of graphite. So basically, they take up the heat from DK heat and then they transfer it to the thermocouples. So here are the thermocouples plant. Right. If you see over here, these are the thermocouples mounted over here. This black color lines that you see, these are the blocks, right? And over the surface of this, you have insulation, which is called thermal insulation. Why do we need it? So that the heat inside, whichever is generated, does not, you can say, escape out. And that is completely utilized for generation of the electricity. Right. So this is how your entire, you can say, RTG works. If I focus a little bit more on the different components, so as I said, this is my system with the fins. This is my GPHS system, which is the source of the fuel heating source. These are the thermocouples mounted. And uh, before that, you have the blocks, which is the, called the distribution blocks. On the surface of this, you have insulation. It is very simple arrangement, right? This arrangement is very simple. And this particular arrangement is being used in many of the applications, right? So basically, uh, if I tell you how does it work, so if you see this blocks, the fuel is, you can say, introduced into this. It starts re releasing its radioactivity. Now, when the DK heat is generated, it is taken up by the blocks, which further converts or can say passes it to the thermocouples. Now, these thermocouples work on the thermoelectric effect. Now, what do you mean by thermoelectric effect? So if you remember, go back in the electronics, if you might have heard about thermoelectric effect, you have Thomson effect. So what exactly happens? Depending upon the temperature gradient generated, that is converted to voltage. So that, that results into the voltage generation, right? which we also call the Seebach effect. right? So Seebach effect is basically a th th thermoelectric energy generated, right? which produces a voltage difference, and then which eventually generates current and obviously the power to the system. Right, so when your thermoelectric circuit is connected in series with any kind of a load, it will be, uh, you can say, providing effective or useful power. So this is how your entire RTT works, right? Now, what should be the property of my RTGs? Uh, sorry, my thermocouples, because thermocouples also play a very important role. Its material of construction plays a great uh, deal. It, it matters. So if it is having low thermal conductivity, it will be providing higher gradient. Low con thermal conductivity, higher gradient, more voltage pro uh, production, and hence for the more energy or the power. Right. So basically, the amount, you can say, material selected for them has wide temperature range, low thermal conductivity, and the high performance thermoelectric materials are there. So basically bismuth terilute, you have lead terilute, germanium, silver, and silicon. So these particular, uh, if, if you see why I'm not reading it, these all elements are utilized for manufacturing of thermocouples. Or basically you can say your thermocouples are based on these materials. Right, so this is how an RTG works. So RTG can be mounted into the aircraft. It can work in the, you can say, spaces where you don't have solar energy, right? So before I go ahead, I wanted to give you a glimpse of the GPS search system. Uh, I have two videos, but uh, hopefully we will be showing that after the session. Uh, I don't think so, my, this is working properly. So maybe we, I can show the video after the after the session uh, gets over, maybe at the end of my session. So if I come down to, as I promised, uh, this is my GPHS system. So GPHS system is general purpose heat source. It is nothing in the form of a block. So if you break down this block, what do you have? This is your main aeroshell. Aeroshell is, you can say, outermost molding. 
into that goes your complete cladding thing so this is your carbon bonded fiber sleeve okay it en encompasses your aero shell this is inside the aero shell you have your floating membrane this is my fuel pallet which is inside this right so into this it, it is being you can say completely cladded with the fuel clad fuel clad and then you have cap and this entire structure goes inside so basically this is just shown to you how the structures are there right so it is if you see it uh, in in person it looks like a block but this block if you uh, bifurcate it is having this all components involved into it now I, as i was telling you about uh, the two types of fuels if we discussed one was plutonium 238 so as plutonium 238 has uh, less gamma radiation this shielding required is less so it becomes thinner now as it becomes thinner the weight reduces now obviously you know that any spacecraft the most important component is weight it has to be minimum as possible so that is also very important whereas if you are using americium you require more shielding okay so this is the entire gps unit so these gps unit can be used 1 2 3 4 recently they have used 8 right in one of the aircraft so these uh what i have and en enlisted over here are the history of the space missions all different space missions that have used the uh, different rtgs okay and it has been taken from or you can say they have been illustrated into the european space agency so i've taken it from there so we have so many you can say online uh, space missions that have successfully accomplished apollo pioneer viking voyager galileo right which have been going for different space mission as a, as well as they are acting as military satellites also providing information for defense right so cassini spacecraft it used uh, obviously rtgs and it provided 870 watts again it used plutonium uh, 3 no uh, 238 it was you can say uh, it went into the saturn orbit in 2004 and if you can see it was terminated in 2017 so almost a gap of 13 years it effectively gave uh the information right it gave gave the it it gave its uh, radioactivity galileo was there then you have viking and rover landers now these landers on mars which were in 1975 they were also dependent on rtg so obviously it is not a new technology there has been modifications and you can say upgrades into this but definitely the rtg model remains the same so you have rtg as we see it is uh, the same heat the uh, Uh, you can say a, a source of fuel were used pathfinder mars robot lander it was also launched in 1996 and it produced 35 watts if you see the watt production is not that much high but yet yet it is being utilized effectively the recent ones ones were, were of voyager 1 and 2 now these spacecrafts uh which shows you 35 years since 1977 it was launched it has been very much effective it has been providing like signals and powers uh different you can say life span it has been used now if you compare this with the regular chemical batteries or photovoltaic cell let's say solar okay you cannot match them because amount of energy and the duration of uh, you can say time it is being effective and in in application is has been immense right so the one that i was talking you about is this one the latest plutonium power rtg is a 290 watt system known as gphs rtg which which we call as gphs rtg rtgs and now in gphs rtgs you are using eight units so eight 18 general purpose units were used not one but 18 so you can imagine how much fuel you are providing as a heat source right so basically this gives you an idea about how different uh, projects has been or different you can say missions has been accomplished but these are the past ones we have the futures right in future also we have couple of modification latest trends coming up so if i go further with that the one which is most recent is called multi mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator rtg remains the same only thing added is multi mission now this has been the latest uh, you can say uh, you can say latest uh, ad advanced technology that uh, nasa and doe has to gather come across and brought this new generation of rtg into picture right so this power system has been it is it can be used for multiple 
tasks right it can be used for different missions it has been made in such a way that it can be used for different missions okay that's the reason the name suggest it has already had a variety of missions uh, for about 110 watts at the launch it is providing right and uh, if you see the design of mmrtg is uh, an having optimizing levels of minimum like optimizing energy or, or optimized energy level and it is providing a lifespan of around 14 years okay just minimum 14 years it can go a little bit more depending upon how it is utilized and then you mmrtg uses a gphs units so if you see over here this is my complete structure of it the bottom part remains the same right these are your radiator fins only at the top of this you have this is your thermoelectric module so they have separated these entire things so this stuff was inside rtg so in mmrtg they have kept it separately this is my thermoelectric unit and this is my rtg unit uh, sorry my gphs unit my source heat source so heat source is over here and this is your so this goes inside right and number of gphs unit increases and this particular is the hardness of it on the top so this is you can say the sectional view of your rtg right so where it has it has been used as i said it has been used in past also as well as in 2020 they are going to have a mission uh, and in that they are going to use mmrtg so it uses uh, 4.8 yeah. sorry Uh, in curiosity, so how many are, of they are uh, using 4.8 kg of plutonium oxide, and they are producing 2 kilowatt of thermal energy, right? So basically, it comes down to 2.7 kilowatt hour per hour, like per day. So this is the amount of energy that is being generated uh, on the regular basis, right? So where are they being used? So basically, MMRTG has been designed for this mass science laboratory projects. So Mars Science Laboratory project has been, you can say, one of the sister concerns of IDAHO and um, uh, Almos, as I said. So they are working in uh, joint uh, projects where they are using multi mm uh, RTGs for different missions. So they have been used uh, uh, in the, the the NASA has already used this in the space mission for Mars, right? It has been used uh, for for if you remember Curiosity Mars rover. So this is very well known. Uh, uh, you can say name. Many of you might be knowing Curiosity Mars rover, which landed in 2012, right? It started its journey in 2011 and it landed on to in 2012. Has MMRTG installed into it. So this is its laboratory figure, and this is already the, when it was launched, and uh, it is in you can say action on Mars. And the Mars laboratory is also uh, planning, okay, so to have a five times uh, more kg of fuel installed, eight ninety kgs of fuel uh, that is your uh, heating source is being used. And another rover, as I said, is going to Mars in 2020, and in that also they are going to introduce MMRTG. They are going to use uh, MMRTG as the heat source and uh, RTGs, which is going to generate a constant source of energy. Right. So this gives you a kind of a uh, you can say idea about how space travel has become easier, or you can say a little bit less difficult. Using RTGs and MMRTGs, so these are you can say is major it, projects. Yeah, is it installed in uh, Perseverance also? Sorry, is it installed uh, in Perseverance also? In Perseverance, I need to check whether it is installed because there are different technologies that is being used, right? So latest, whichever rovers are there, they are having MMRTGs or RTG, at least one of them. Right, so which specific type it is being installed that we need to see, okay. right? Okay. Thanks. Students, uh, please keep your questions till end. Uh, and my Hello. my little bit link is sorry, taken. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry for interruption. Please, all the participants are requested to uh, write your question in chat box only, so that that continuity will be not disturbed. So it is requested all of you to uh, write your question in chat chat box only. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No problem. Okay. So uh, going forward. so that is what your space is about now coming to defense defense military applications so you might be knowing that there are long conveyors or can say uh, huge conveyors of the different uh, militaries which is going for uh, you can say random rural places where there are less there is no electricity there is no water right and because of that many of the casualty casualties takes place right so then 
but thing came into mind is how to use uh, this nuclear technology or use the nuclear power in the defense also to provide or to facilitate in defense so basically the idea was of as i said the two laboratories were working on the idea of generating the they have already small modular reactors small modular reactors are you can say mini versions of the large power plants that you see they have chain reaction going on but at the same time they are very small in structure so that is the reason it can be traveled through in the trucks and it can be also transferred through airplanes right security and safety definitely has to be taken care of also there is a fear of a prol uh, non we have a non proliferation treaty but there is a fear of proliferation now what do you mean by that is stealing of nuclear uh energy for making weapons okay so that is also one thing which has to be you can say so all these things are still under research okay they are being uh, you can say investigated they are on the power plant plant stage some of them have been you can say ordered to produce for 2020 up to 2025 right so if you see this is you can say future model something it will look like this that in a truck you can have installed uh you can say small or micro uh, we call it as a micro nuclear reactor and that can go places and provide the effective electricity right so small nuclear reactors offers you can say a uh, same uh, you can say technology of providing electricity right but it is in the range of 1 to 10 megawatt right so there is for obviously the same thing you do not need the refueling for a longer period of time okay it is completely autonomous okay if you lo load it fully and only thing you have to keep is your the cooling has to be very much active and here it is said passive but actually it has to be active at the site so you can take it and combine assemble at the site so that is the you can say main advantage of small modular reactors or very small modular reactors or micro reactors so there are three ranges of it So if you see over here this is uh, i've taken it from the you can say a world nuclear association a uh, transcript from a spokesperson he gave that um, the small nuclear reactors nowadays are coming into three different modes or three different forms first one are the small modular reactors which we call smrs okay generates 20 to 300 megawatt electric electrical of energy second category is 10 to 100 megawatt and have been used in transport such as ice breakers okay so ice breakers has been used in the you can say uh, navigation and it has been used in the uh, uh, what do you call the submarines right for defense purpose obviously and the third category which is you can say everyone is looking for pentagon means us is looking for and all the other have i on is in micro reactors so micro reactors are the smallest version of reactors which you can see and which can be traveled anywhere providing electricity and energy for pure drinking water electricity needs okay whether it is in defense or it is being used for rural places right the very places where the regular electricity does not work so i've tried to you can say uh, give you a small uh, you can say site in site into how does a small modular reactor works okay so basically before i go into that details let me give you an idea about how does a nuclear reactor work right so basically a nuclear reactor consists of uh, four major uh, major or you can say main things one is its actual nuclear core the core means the fuel right the nuclear fuel which undergoes fission reaction and generates heat right the second are the control rods now these control rods are used to absorb those extra neutrons so if you remember i explained to you that the, there are three neutrons generated during every session of a fission reaction right so every fission reaction gives you three neutrons but if all three go together there will be uh, you can say the chain reaction will not be controlled so for that reason control rods absorb the excess of neutrons so that only one neutron can go ahead at time and it can carry out controlled fission reaction right then you have the this system if you see over here uh, so i'll i'll come down, down to what whatever the uh, components i'm talking about into this system later on 
Then third system you have is primary and uh, secondary cooling system. Primary cooling system is generally your moderator or cooling uh, liquid, which will be taking up the nuclear heat. Okay, the heat that is generated, it will get heated. And that heated uh, water, definitely it is not in direct contact, but through convection, it is going to give the heat to the another secondary water loop. Okay, so the water which is there in the secondary loop is the, the regular water. Okay, it is not heavy water, it is not a moderator. So it is just taking up the water, the heat from the primary heating system, a primary loop. And that uh, you can say uh, heat is being used to uh, generate steam and that steam further runs the turbine in order to generate electricity. So this is the entire system. And this entire thing is under pressure. It is having a pressurizer. So what will happen? As we know, the, through thermodynamics, pressure is directly proportional to temperature. As you increase the pressure, temperature increase. That means the boiling points go high. Your water, we don't want to boil it. Okay, So that is the reason it is kept under very high pressure. Right now, if I bring everything, so these are the separate components in an actual nuclear fission power plant. But if you combine that into a small modular reactor, it looks something like this. So this is my a small SMR or a small modular reactor. If I little bit closer up to show you. So if you see over here, you are having your core. The core is where your fuel is located. Right. Your, this is the heart of the reactor. It is having the fuel tubes. OK, and it is going to generate or create continue the fission reaction. Now, due to this fission reaction, a huge amount of heat is generated, right? Now, these are your control rods. Now, these control rods, again, are lowered or brought up depending upon the requirement of absorption of the neutrons, right? Then you have, there is a complete, you can say, piping system, which I'll be showing in the second uh, figure. So this piping system, if you see, it is somewhere over here. If I show you over here that little bit in. Uh, OK, so if you see over here, this is my core from this core. The heat is generated, right? And this comes out through a chimney effect. This is my heat or you can say uh, moderating fluid, which is taking up the heat from the system. It is not you can say inside the tubes. It is just outside the tubes. So these are your fuels. By on the back side, the fuel tubes. Heat generated from this is taken up by this uh, moderator. This moderator coolant fuel goes up, okay, and this heat is taken up by the system. If you see these pipes on the back side, it is having the secondary cooling system. So they will be taking up the heat from here, okay, and that heat is sent to the generator, and there the heat steam generation takes place. If you see on the back side, okay, on the on this back side you have a steam generator. So this entire system works. In the form, as I said, conduction, convection. These are the two phenomena which is taking place. Convection through the primary loop, loop to the secondary loop, and conduction. If you see over here, through in the in the heating system, it is taking place, which is called primary coolant, right? So your entire thing is taking uh, go, going up on the basis of that. So basically, then you have your steam generation system, which converts water into the secondary loop, loop into steam, right? And then you are taking it up now. If you have, if you see over here, you have pressurizer. So all these components are combined in a small module, which we call as a small modular reactor, right? So core, as I said, it generates fission process, produces energy and heat, control rods, which absorb the excess of neutrons, okay, and just continue the, you can say, controlled chain reaction. Reactor coolant, which takes up the heat and passes it to the secondary. Uh, heating system, or the we also call it as a uh, heating loop, secondary loop, right? And then it passes through the steam generator because steam is generated, and that steam is used to run the uh, your generator. Sorry, the, to run the generator in order to, to, to generate electricity. The steam is used to drive the turbine, which generates electricity. And then throughout this process, the entire the pressure is kept very high because the coolant water should not boil out. Right, we don't want the steam to be generated inside. Otherwise, what will happen? A huge surge of steam will be generated inside the primary tube. The same thing happened in Chernobyl. And because of this, it blasted. 
right? So these things you have to keep in mind whenever you are having, uh, you can say, designing of an, any small or modular reactors are taking place. So this is your small modular reactor, and this is how it works. So as I said, these studies have been on the, you can say, uh, preliminary stage or pilot plant stage. This is being used and made. Small modular reactors has been used in other applications also. I would not go in detail of that. But small modular reactors has been used in other applications. But however, the, 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 the application in defense is still into the its initial stage. But there was a good news. I, I took this article. Uh, I generally read the nuclear news. So I got this news that Pentagon awards contracts to design mobile nuclear reactors. So basically, Pentagon means uh, the US. So the US is interested in these contracts, right? So they have given contract to make mobile nuclear reactors which will go forward in using or it will be used for the American forces in home, that means in US as well as wherever they are going abroad, right? In the countries where they are, uh, where there, there is no facilities of electricity, for them, they, they, this is, uh, you can say, very uh, good news. And uh, as I said, in morning, I just read about uh, uh, Ottawa also giving uh, some similar kind of contracts. So basically, this, uh, why I showed you, because this gives us an indication that uh, we will be seeing the use of nuclear in defense full-fledged in the coming future, right? So this is what I wanted to um, present. I hope I have not taken much of my time. It was one hour and I al already took one hour. Thank you very much. And um, uh, now the session is open for questions. If you want, I can just keep the I can stop sharing so that I can see the students and we can have a very good conversation. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Thank for you everyone for uh, listening to me. So uh, you can say silently and uh, with concentration, hopefully. Now the session is open for the any questions if you have. And uh, when you uh, ask the question, just uh, be sure that you just speak up your name and if you can just start your video if it is possible. So we can have a, a, a good conversation. Arun sir, if you can uh, ask them yes, because sir. maybe if they listen to you. <laughs> Students, if you're having any questions. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Question, sir. The session is open for discussion. Participants are requested yes. to ask the questions. And you are not audible. Hello, can I audio, ma'am? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. From the participant side, uh, any questions regarding that today's webinar? Hello? Uh, sir. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Arun, sir. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, you are Can audible. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you show yes, the videos that I've sent because uh, I'm unable to share them. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mangesh, sir, please share that video. Sir, with, you are muted. Uh, I cannot hear you. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Sir, you are muted. I cannot hear you. No, no, no. Hello, hello. Arun, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma hello. Mute? Yes, ma'am. No, no, no. Not at all. 
हेलो कैन आई ऑडियबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू हेलो प्लीज यस सर कैन आई ऑडियबल हेलो ओके पार्थ यू कैन पार्थ यू कैन आस्क योर क्वेश्चन सर आई ऑलरेडी आस्क्ड आई गॉट माय आंसर एनीबॉडी एल्स प्लीज एनीबॉडी कैन आस्क आई कैन नॉट हियर यू आई कैन नॉट हियर यू सर नथिंग कैन बी हर्ड बाय सर आई वाज रिक्वेस्टिंग यू टू प्लीज प्ले दोस वीडियोस first you can show yeah, yes, of gphs system and then uh, uh, for the small modular reactor mangesh sir can you uh, play that audio sir uh, this screen is visible no right now uh, not visible हेलो कैन आई ऑडियबल टू ऑल ऑफ यू हेलो हेलो मंगेश सर सर यू आर ऑडियबल यू कैन आस्क द क्वेश्चन बाय अनम्यूटिंग योर सेल्फ इंस्टेड ऑफ राइटिंग डाउन इन द चैट इट वुड बी बेटर स्टूडेंट्स इट विल बी गिविंग यू एन आइडिया ऑफ अ एक्चुअल कन्वर्सेशन student are requested to directly ask hello, uh, you sir, can I... uh, you you hello student participant please uh, you can turn on your video also students we are going to see the video of gphs system which i showed you right now general purpose heating source Can you make those full screen, please? Yeah. I am playing this video. Okay, friends. So this is the GPS system. It is, you can say, looks like this: a small block, and then uh, these are the different, you can say, components of it. If you see, this is the radium metal cladding. Inside, you have your plutonium two thirty eight dioxide pallet, right? This is the complete uh, combination or how it is being clubbed. It, this much of a uh, cladding is required inside. So this is the aero shell which keeps it intact and it does not allow any kind of radiations to come out. Yeah, you can play. Ma'am, I have a question. Can I ask now, or should I wait for uh, end of the video? Please wait uh, till that uh, that video will be completed. Okay. okay. Mangesh sir, please uh, continue that video. Sir, can you please play the video? Ma'am, can you audible to me, Rakhi ma'am? Hello, hello. Can you audible to me, Rakhi ma'am? Please. They would like it. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Can Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? No, I can hear you. But since uh, when you were talking, I was unable to listen to you because it looks as if you were you are muted. No, no. Ah. Uh, You, you. I can hardly hear you again. I was asking you to play the second video, please. Mankesh, can you please play the second video? 
मैम आई थिंक आई मीन राइट हेलो मैडम यस यस हेलो या माय वॉइस इज ऑडिबल यस यस या इट इज ऑडिबल आई थिंक बिकॉज़ ऑफ द इंटरनेट कनेक्टिविटी एक्चुअली एक्चुअली आई एम लॉग इन फ्रॉम अदर डिवाइसेस सो फॉर बिकॉज़ ऑफ द नॉट प्रॉपर कनेक्टिविटी इंटरनेट कनेक्टिविटी आई एम नॉट एबल टू प्लेइंग दिस वीडियो Okay, let me do one thing. I can play the video from my screen. Uh, the sound is okay. I will explain as and when it will be coming. Is it? It is. Is is it okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Let me do that. Yeah, because I want to show that video because that is you can say the need of today and definitely going to be a future for everyone. So I would like sure, to show that. Sure. Sure. Sure, ma'am. <laughs> due to certain technical issue it is right now not possible ma'am uh, sorry for <laughs> no problem i understand that no issue yes hello yeah one sec yeah yes now we can uh, uh, yes connectivity is proper now we can shoot it you can try if you want if not then uh, now i will Yes, madam. It's visible. It's visible. You yeah. no. So it's visible from my side. No, it's from my side. It's visible. Okay, fine. So let me stop this, and I'll come back to you. Yes. Mangal sir, play this video with sound. Yeah, yeah. I think sound is not properly audible. Military bases yeah. in the most remote, okay, challenging now, locations. Okay, now, okay, almost okay. national lab. Okay, There's a fine. small portable nuclear reactor to provide power to disaster areas, or rural towns far beyond the reaches of power lines, or hospitals in remote parts of the world, or military bases in the most remote, challenging locations. Los Alamos National Laboratory is developing the technology to do just this. The small reactor uses heat pipe technology to generate one megawatt of safe, reliable power. That megawatt can power approximately 1,000 houses. The entire system will fit on the back of a semi truck in a robust container to ensure its safety and make it easy to transport to remote areas. This technology sprung from Los Alamos's work to develop a small nuclear reactor for NASA that might someday power a colony on Mars or the Moon. So we asked the question, how could we use this same technology for Earth-based purposes? To answer that question, Los Alamos partnered with the power company Westinghouse, which will use the technology to manufacture the reactors. In less than five years, it should be I ready for deployment, the sound has gone. helping to support humanitarian and military missions. Okay, so students, these are the uh, this is the uh, modular form form of it, which is developed by Los Alamos National Laboratory. What if we could use a small port? Mange sir, please go for the second video also. Sir, both videos are uh, played, sir. Okay. Okay, now uh, once again we come uh, come to that question uh, on the session part. Want to ask you something, ma'am? Uh, some question is in mind of that part, Joshi. Please ask part your question. Can you hear me, part? Hello. Yes, yes, yes. You can. Uh -huh. You can turn on your video also. Please, you can turn on your video also, so that interaction will be proper. Hello, I think so. Your voice is not uh, audible. Hello. 
No, uh, your voice is not audible. I cannot hear you. I have to read. I cannot hear you. Hello. Am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, you are audible. The question no, is not audible to me at all. I don't know why. Ma'am, uh, in uh, some reactor, uh, there is a use of heavy water. What is the use of heavy water in nuclear power plant? Okay. Uh, okay. Can you uh, hear me, ma'am? Hello, ma'am. Can you hear me? Okay. Let me take the question from the chat box itself. I am unable to hear you anything. Can you check, uh, Mangesh, why it is happening? I cannot hear any student's voice. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear uh, to me, ma'am? Hello? I cannot hear any one of you. I think uh, some technical issue from your side, ma'am. Okay, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, I'll take that. I am unable to hear any any one of you, so hopefully you are uh, able to uh, listen to me. Sir, am I audible? Can you just say yes or no by nodding your head? Yes, sir. Okay, there are two questions. So, first one is how do we manage waste generated in RTGs and SMRs? Can you hear me first? Confirm that. Anyone has to confirm. Because yes, sir. yes, madam. Your voice is audible. Yes, okay. Okay. So going ahead with the question, I have got two questions. Uh, one is how do you manage waste generated in RTGs? Now the waste in RTGs, obviously it is going to be a dangerous situation in case if it leaks at the, at the, at the launch or maybe even in space, so it is going to, uh, you can say, have the leakage and the radiation is going to be here. And it can Please be a deadly your situation. Mic when, that is hello, the reason I showed you the construction of a GPHS system. We don't have fuel directly installed into the RTGs. You have in the form of blocks, right, which is called the GPHS system, and it is having iridium cladding. Okay, so this cladding, as well as the graphite blocks, which are there around it and the aerosol shell, they have a capability of absorbing some of the radioactivity into it before it is uh, given out or maybe it is uh, coming out in the form of uh, any kind of radiation. Right, so that is one of the, you can say, a safety precaution is there. Second thing, they are keeping, uh, you can say, radioactive absorption materials along with it, which is helping it to re reduce any kind of such uh, radioactivity if it is there. The second question is, uh, nuclear energy can be used for space heating? Yes. Uh, so if, if, I, if you remember, I told you about the system of, um, uh, it was a thermoelectric heating unit. So these thermoelectric heating units are small versions of RTGs only, and they are uh, they are used for space heating purpose, right? Not exactly space heating, but they are they are used to heat the components of the system because the system, uh, the aircraft goes into the cold colder regions and cool places. So where there is a possibility of um, uh, there is a possibility that uh, the system gets cooled off and the components that are, uh, has to be maintained with the, that particular temperature. So for that reason, these uh, are, uh, RHUs uh, use are being used, right? Then you have uh, MEM use of heavy water in power plants. So heavy water is specifically which we call deuterium oxide D2O. It is used as a moderator, okay? In many of the reactors, maybe heavy pressure, uh, heavy pressure reactor or uh, 
uh, pressurized water reactors. You have a uh, use of uh, uh, heavy water as moderator. It is also acting as coolant. So its function is to absorb the heat from the nuclear core and pass it on to the secondary cooling system or secondary water system where it is converted into steam and then it eventually generates the electricity. Okay, and uh, how, how do we manage waste generated in RTGs that I've already talked about? Right, so I think so almost all the questions I have answered. Anything else you would, you would like to ask? I cannot hear you guys anything. I'm just speaking <laughs> up on the basis of whatever is there on the chat. Till now, we were Hello? using solid Hello? fuel in the reactor and you... Till now, we, we were using solid fuel in the reactor and few research says that we can even use liquid fuel in the reactor. So can brief about that, ma'am. Now liquid fuel ut utility or use in the, uh, you can say reactors uh, is possible, but it is not on the, you can say uh, higher, higher stages. It's still on the pilot plant stage and not that much. You can say, uh, obviously, wherever you are seeing, if you, if you have seen the, nuclear fuel tubes, right? The fuels are in the form of pallets. Oh, and these pallets are, you can say, multiple defense, defense we call it in nuclear as how many claddings it is provided in order to prevent any radiation to go out, right? The so fuel pallets are there and these fuel pallets are used in the form of, you can say, uh, fuel tubes, the bundles of fuel, tube, fuel tubes, which we call calendria, uh, is used in Kandu type of reactors, right? So generally use of liquid fuels, uh, I have not read about that much, but maybe would look love to look into it, this particular field also. Uh, how many modular reactor used for defense? You cannot say the number as of now. I just gave you an idea about that. Uh, still, US is planning to order, or they have ordered recently to make the micro reactors or modular reactors for the defense purposes. But still, uh, you can say effective ap applicability of it uh, has not been in paper or maybe in any of the news. So definitely it is uh, on the research page. Okay. Mama, he has asked about the how small modular reactor. Uh, I think so. There are no more questions. Thank you so much, uh, um, everyone, for your wonderful uh, patience. And uh, I, I don't know whether I'm able to reach, reach out to you, but I'm thanking you all. And thank you. Special thanks to uh, Arun sir for uh, approaching for the lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for explaining uh, all these concepts of RTGS and MMRTGS. I cannot utility, hear you, ma'am. Utility. Ma'am, I think some uh, there is some technical issue from your side. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed the session. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Arun, sir. Arun, sir. I request Arun, sir, to propose vote of thanks. Arun, sir, can you hear me? Can I hear to all of you? Can I hear to all of you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Arun, sir, I request you to propose vote of thanks, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you and good morning to uh, uh, Rakhi, ma'am. But I think Rakhi, ma'am, is right now not audible to all of us. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, I mean, I'll Rakhi, ma'am, is up, uh, have some uh, technical issue due to that. Uh, Rakhi, ma'am, is whatever we are speaking, uh, that is not audible to Rakhi, ma'am. But still, uh, from our Sorry, bottom... Sorry, I have tried uh, using... Uh, Different okay, mode anyway, of uh, uh, let's move to that. Uh, also, but it is not working. Uh, honorable dignitaries, invited guests, and participant of the webinar, today's webinar that advanced future application of nuclear energy, space, and defense. Uh, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of Chemical Engineering Department, Government Engineering College, uh, Baruch. First of all, 
I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to uh, today's speaker of the webinar, Dr. Rakhi Mehta, ma'am, who has spared her valuable time for us and graced this occasion with her valuable presence as well as uh, for sharing expertise in webinar talk. Even though busy schedule, uh, ma'am has accepted our invitation and share her valuable experience in the field of nuclear science. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for your cooperation uh, for our institute and hoping similar kind of uh, your support in future also. I extend my warm and sincere thanks to uh, Dr. S. R. Joshi, sir, uh, Principal, C. Baruch, for your vision and commitment to work and its execution, respected sir, because of your motivation and continuous support in all the way, it is possible for us to arrange such successful event. We okay. as a team... Thank you everyone. I rest my case now. <laughs> Hopefully okay, I cannot hear anything from your side. I am just okay. getting thanks message from all of you. So thank you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed a lot. Uh, for this uh, session and hopefully I was able to connect to the UN as well as students and try to give whatever little bit I have and hopefully it was um, uh, interesting to all of you and I did not bore you right yeah, thank yeah, you so yeah. much thank, thank you, you and uh, have a nice day be safe take care okay Bye. Uh Yes, yes ma'am, yes ma'am, but whatever we are speaking, uh, that ma'am is not audible, so it is a little bit difficult for us. But anyway, uh, I will continue my, uh, I mean, a lot of thanks. Uh, uh, I mean, we as a team also extend our sincere thanks to Professor N.R. Vagela, sir, head of uh, Department Chemical Engineering, GC Baroth, for becoming backbone in our all the efforts and consistently motivating and inspiring us in all kind of work. Thank you, sir. We are also thankful to all the authorities and faculty member of uh, GC Baruj and invited guests uh, to grace the occasion. I would also extend my uh, wholehearted gratitude and sincere thanks to our all the participants, which includes faculty members, representatives from various industries, and students uh, for joining this webinar. Without all your active participation, it, it would not be possible for us to make this event that much grand success. Last but not least, my special thanks to all department faculty members and my colleagues. Because of their sincere efforts, I mean your sincere efforts, in all the way this event becomes successful. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the immense contribution of your dedicated, uh, I mean our dedicated faculty members. Thank you all for making this program a huge success. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think we are at the end of the session. And, uh, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now we okay, are sir. concluding our session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, sir. Thank you. Video one.